use it in a mighty way, Father, to encourage us, but Father, also to convict us, to walk nearer to you, Father, to give you our best. Father, that's all we desire. Sometimes that best isn't good enough in our eyes. But Father, if we've done it all we can do, then I know you'd be pleased. So Father, I thank you for that and just pray your Holy Spirit would use this. Father, touch hearts and lives. But Father, most of all, allow him just to, to convict us to walk closer. And Father, we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we grew up, we ate a lot of leftovers. Mom would fix food and, and we still do that same thing. Sometimes we'll fix enough food for three days and, you know, if we're busy when a lot coming up, we'll eat that for the next three days and, and find okay with that. But at certain times, leftovers are good. Um, well, you all can relate to this. You know, if you fix a big old pot of spaghetti, it usually tastes better the next day. You know, because it's had time to marinate in the sauce and it's had time to, to bring all that together to where it all meshes. And, you know, it's usually better at that second time around. But I remember growing up, you know, we were six kids and, and uh, you know, mom had fixed food. And if there wasn't enough left over, which there usually wasn't, you know, for another meal or even a snack, it went to the dog, you know, and, and the old dog was happy. And, uh, and I guess that made everybody happy. But at the same time, I look at that and realize that at times life seems that way. You know, we give our leftovers. We only give people our leftovers. And to me, that's a sad way to live our life because we are to give our best. I believe we're to give our best in everything that we do. I believe we're to give our best at our jobs, our families. But I believe most of all, we're to give the Lord our best. We're to give him everything that I can possibly give him. And the answer to ask that question is why? Why is it that we do that? But I think it's so many times we look at our lives and we focus on ourselves. We want to give everybody the leftovers because everything else is kept for me. We're so wrapped up in mine, mine, mine. And it gets sad at that point. And you can see this all around life. And it, it, it is, I, I, it bothers me when I see this. Now I look at our little dogs and I see the same thing. It's interesting, we had a little dog, uh, she died a few years back and I love this little dog. Her name was Cricket. That little dog was the biggest thief you ever seen in your life. She was a thief. Everything in that house she thought was hers, every toy. She would wait for one of them dogs to turn her head or walk away and she, I'd watch her all the time and she would dart out of her little area, grab that toy and run back. Well, one day she had a little blanket under her, her little box and we started missing all the toys. Where all the toys go? We pulled that blanket up and underneath that blanket, she had stuffed all them toys. They were all hers. They were all hers. Today, this one does the same thing. She'll lay in a bed once and get out of it. Sasha will go over to get in and here she'll come growling, thinking it's hers. They all three got a bed. What matters which bed you're in? Just get in the bed. But that is hers. And that's the way they look at it. And they look at life in that way. I think from an early age, we've learned this. We've learned to selfishly look at things in our life to say, that is mine. I mean, if you've ever grew up and had to share a room with your brother or your sister, you understand this real well. This is mine. Keep your hands off of it. I'll bust you in the head. That's the way it went. This is mine. And right away, being an older brother, he ain't too bright. He's sitting there trying to grab your stuff all the time. And the fight's on. Why? That is mine. Don't you touch it. What is sad is we look at life that same way and we bring that right into our Christian walk. We do this everywhere we go. We fight for its possession. We fight because it's mine. And sadly enough, we look at Christ in that same mentality. This is my life. You're not going to tell me what to do with it. This is my life. But you're wrong. It is not your life. Because when you desired to walk down that narrow path, you gave up that right. You gave up that right. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 6, 20. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are what? God's. It is not yours. 
Now, you may think it is, and you want to look at it in that way. But if you truly have come to Christ, you gave up that right. It is not yours. It's his. Now, we can relate to this in modern day life. We can look at this in a great way, and we all can relate to this. We go out to look at a new car. Man, all them little bells and whistles and all that pretty paint. Everything smells new. You look in there, man, all the sides, man, all the things start running in your brain thinking, I got to have that. I got to have that. What do we do? We walk in there and start signing paperwork. We start signing paperwork because I want that car. And it's interesting because what happens is once we sign in papers, we get the keys and we walk out and we think we own that car. And we go out and tell everybody, hey, look at my new car. Look at that thing. Man, she's shiny. She's bright. Well, let me be the bearer of bad news to you. You don't own that car. The bank owns that car because the bank holds the title to the car. You are just using it. That's what we have in this life. We are just using this body. This is what God has gave us, this container to walk in every single day. And it's up to us to realize who owns this because it is not you. He says right there, you are bought with a price. Christ hung on that cross. He took them stripes for you and me. And he purchased you by his blood. Therefore, glorify God in your body. That's your responsibility. Why? Because he owns you. You say, well, that's not right. That's not fair. This is mine. No, 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 no. He gave you life the minute you was conceived in that womb. This is what makes abortion so wrong, and it makes it murder. Because that's a human life that took place right there. And when you was given life in that womb, you was God's at that moment. Because he gave you life, greatest miracle that ever takes place. And to me, it's exciting to see. But we are bought with a price. Each of us walking this narrow path must understand this. Know what Paul tells us here. 1 Corinthians 15, 31. I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord. What I die daily. Paul understood this. Paul understood that his life was not his own the minute he desired to walk down that narrow path. And when we walk down that narrow path, I'm his. Because I make that choice to veer from that wide path onto this narrow one, which is telling me that I'm following Jesus and I'm going to put my life before him. I'm going to put my life before him and I'm going to walk with him. I'm going to forsake this to do this. Why? Because that's the path he's leading me on because he already purchased me. And I died daily to that old man. That's exciting to me. Understand something. God is a gentleman. <clears throat> He's a gentleman. He is not going to force you to make, to make you walk with him. He's not going to force you down that path. He wants you to come willingly. We make the choice when we stand at them gates. When we looked at the very first sermon I preached in this series, we stand at that gate and we make our decision of which one we're going to go. And when I make that decision to follow Christ, I am to die daily if I want to stay on that narrow path. This is what must take place. He's not going to force us to do that. I'm going to make that choice in loving obedience and never move from that position. That's what was required of me. Why? Because he owns the title. I'm just walking in his grace. And that's awesome to me. But what this does is force a reality check into our life. I face this every day to where we ask the question, am I walking in obedience to him? That's the decision I have to ask myself continually, maybe 10 times a day, maybe more. Am I walking in obedience to this word? Am I walking in obedience to Jesus? Because that's our goal. That's the desire we must have. This question is nothing new. This is something that's been fighting Christian people for forever. But know what Paul says here in this verse in Romans 7, 19. 
for the good that I would, I do not. And this is a real moment to Paul. I, I believe that he's really being transparent in his life at this point. He goes on to say, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Paul's making a great point for us here. If Paul has to do this very same thing and make a reality check out of his own life, you better be too. We have to come to a place where we check that continually. And when we can do that, Paul realized what was before him. And we must as well. If we know that that's something that we fight every day, then we must put our all into fighting it. Fighting it back, pushing it aside so that I can stay on that narrow path. And when I'm telling you this starts to fight you, that path is going to get narrow. It's going to get real narrow. And we must stand strong that we do not fall by the wayside. We must ask a question. Do we walk forward down the path at this point in obedience? Or am I going to fall to the evil way? Am I going to fall to that old nature? Am I going to fall to that old mindset? And veer right back to that wide path. And so many do it continually. Paul makes it very clear in Romans 6, 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey, whether it's the good or whether it's the evil, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. That's our choice. That's the choice we make every day. One is going to walk in obedience. The one is going to walk in disobedience. And when we walk in disobedience, we are not going to make it down that narrow path. We're going to fall by the wayside. When we bowed to Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we yielded ourselves to him. We yielded ourselves. Every one of you did. You had no choice at that point. If you bowed your knee, you yielded. But the thing of it is, we have to stay there. We have to continue to yield. I want you to look at this verse, because this is, to me, a powerful verse. Galatians 3.27 for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. What does that mean? It simply means that when we come to Christ, when we put him on, we received his spirit. We received his spirit. We are to share his interests. That way, my interest is no more important. My life now has become about his interests. The things that he desires, the things that he tells us in his word. But when we see this and we go forward, we also know that because of that, we assume his character. We assume the character of Christ. We take all his attributes and begin to walk in him, allowing ourselves to draw near to him by who he is and how he acts. We become somebody that when people see us, they see Jesus. Now ask yourself this question. What do people see when they look at you? What do they see when they look at you? Do they see Christ? Or do they just see another fallen saint who doesn't live up to who Jesus is? But if I've yielded, that's what I should be doing. If I've yielded, I should walk in that way. Understand this. Jesus came to do the will of the Father. He came to do his will. He did not do it in acts of disobedience. He was obedient in every act he did. Every act was obedient. It served him. Because he did not work in the spirit of disobedience. And we must not either. Just giving him the leftovers. We cannot just give God the leftovers and think he's going to bless our life. Now this is a big deal. How can I expect to get God the best from God if I'm not giving God my best? It's an awesome thought. And it's something that we must look at. Many look at this and, it, it, and they can't even comprehend it. How is it even possible to be able to do that? How is it possible? It's too much. You can't expect us to live like that. I can't, but God can. God can. Sometimes I've, I've always thought of myself as too, I'm not going to say liberal because I'm not liberal at all, but, but I think lenient maybe. Because I think a lot of things that we do is between you and God. It's between you and God. You can disobe disobe be, be, dis be disobedient to me all you want. It's not really going to matter. 
But don't you be disobedient to God. Because the only thing that's going to happen there is you're going to lose. And you're going to fall off that narrow path. It may not be today or next week, but you will fall. It will be just a matter of time. Paul understood this. When Paul faced these reality checks in life, he summed it up this way in this verse, Galatians 2.20. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Paul understood what was required of him. He had to be like Jesus. Now, if you read this with the book of Romans, it becomes something that's very important. Paul understood who he was. He knew he was a sinner, but he knew he was saved by grace. And because of that, he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Now, what that's telling us is it's a spiritual crucifixion. I died spiritually. Now I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That is a powerful, powerful verse of Scripture. But Paul understood when he had these reality checks in his own life that he was crucified daily. He died daily. And because of that, Christ was able to live through him. Sometimes we look at our life and we say, well, Christ isn't living through me. Have you died to self? Have you died daily? Have you come to that place in your life? Paul understood he was not his own. That's the bottom line. He understood that he wasn't his own. He was bought with that price. We can and must live in obedience to the Word of God. A fellow by the name of Archibald Rutledge uh, made a statement one day about a man he met. This man was a lumberjack, and he always took his dog to work with him. And that dog was an obedient animal. And what he would do, he would get in a clearing where the dog was in the shade, and he'd set his lunch bucket down, and he told the dog, sit there and watch my dinner. He says, I will see you at lunchtime. So the dog stayed there and watched his lunch. Well, unknown to the man, a forest fire started behind the dog. The man didn't know it, didn't know it was near his dog. Eventually, that forest fire caught the dog, and that dog never moved. He stayed right there and guarded that lunch bucket until it took his life. This man was brokenhearted over his dog. It was his best friend. And he told Rutledge, he said, I always had to be careful what I told that dog. He says, because no matter what I told him, he would do it. And he said, he died in obedience to what I told him. And the guy was just brokenhearted over it because that dog was so obedient to just guarding a dinner bucket. How much obedience should we have like that to the Father? That he tells us to do something, we do it instantly. We need this type of obedience in our life, giving our life to something that's even the most common thing something that is really nothing a man's lunch but that dog thought it was everything for the simple reason that his owner told him to stay and guard his dinner what has god told us repeatedly when we still don't obey we still go through the motions of life living in that disobedience with no thought of the situation how it's going to please god it's a very convicting thing. When we examine what takes place in our life, we will not allow our minds to rationalize obedience. We can't rationalize it away and find an excuse for why I'm doing what I'm doing. We have to come by the obedience of Christ. I think we can see from God's Word a living example of this. And, and through this series, I've tried to do this, show you from Scripture examples. And I don't think there's a better example here than Cain and Abel. Now, when we look at Cain and Abel, so many times we think that God rejected Cain's offering because it wasn't a blood sacrifice. We look at it in that way. And I mean, it's possible you can look at it in that way, but I think there's more to this story than that. I think there's far more in that because it's a good thought, but I don't know if that thought's really accurate. Let's note the scripture and we'll, we'll break it down. Genesis 4, 3 through 8. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? 
If thou dost well, shall not shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou dost not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Now when we look at this, Cain made a lot of mistakes in his offering. Now when you look at this, there's a key thing I think in this, and I think it's in the very first sentence. In the process of time, it came to pass. I think this is key to understanding the scripture because we don't know if by this statement if this was the first offering or many. But by the way it started, by this statement, I believe that they had brought many other offerings. And in the process of time, it came to pass. We don't know how long that was or how many offerings. I don't believe it was the first. I believe that through time, Cain just gave up. Cain just wasn't going to do it no more. Cain come with the same mentality that we do so many times. It's mine, it's all mine, and I'm keeping the best. And that's what he did. Now, they could have brought this multiple times. But I think in the beginning, Cain probably brought the right offerings. But the time grew on, it went away from him. So the first mistake and the one we make is that we believe that we brought something that was good enough. That was the way he thought. This offering was good enough. So many times we live our life that same way. We give God so much and we think that's good enough. I've prayed for 20 minutes. That's good enough. Well, you might not even broke through the wall yet. You might not even got through the barrier. What if that barrier was only another five minutes away and you quit? That's good enough. That's good enough. We've all been there. But that doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it right at all. Cain also failed in his attitude by the rebuke that he received. Now, it's interesting if you look at this, because instead of asking why the offering wasn't good enough, he just got mad. And this, to me, is a sure indicator that, Abel, or that Cain knew he was doing wrong. He knew that he was wrong in his offering by his reaction. So when we look at this in the right way, we got to look at the wording. Again, if you look at this in the Hebrew, that word wroth that it mentions here, it means that he glowed, blazed, hot with anger. This guy was having a meltdown. It wasn't just anger. He was totally melting down. And when we look at this, it's an interesting thing because Cain could see that his pride had been violated. That's all he's seen. His pride now flared up and said, hey, you ain't going to do that to me. My offering was good enough. Have you ever been wrong and you fight like crazy, knowing that you're wrong, but you're holding your ground because that was what I said and I'm holding to it and I'll fight to the death because I don't want you to know I'm wrong. Well, that's what Cain was doing. He was arguing with God to the point that he was right no matter what. But let's focus on the main reason here. You know, I said earlier that the, about the blood sacrifice because we have to be aware that what Cain did was simply disobedience. It was simply disobedience. He didn't get to the right offering. So let's dig deeper and see what it says. It states that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground. Now, this is where it gets interesting, and this is where we have to pay attention. By the law, we can get a good understanding of this because the law specifically says what each one is to bring by their profession. Now, Cain, he was a tiller of the ground. Abel, he was a herder. He kept his sheep. He kept his flocks. Abel was righteous because he brought the best of his flocks. He brought the fat. He brought everything that was good about his offering. It was perfect. Cain, I believe, only not only grew vegetables, but Cain also grew fruit. This is the key. So when we look at this, if you're a tiller of the ground, you're making everything that's coming out of the ground, whether it's vegetables or fruit, it's a tiller of the ground. You're going to make everything that bursts in the ground. So I believe that Cain was at this point. Now, we read the first fruits of the offering in Leviticus, Leviticus 27:30. Now watch and read this carefully. It says, in all the tithe of the land, the, all of it that he grows 
out of the ground, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree is the Lord's. Now watch, watch what it says. It's the seed. It's the seed. What's vital in this statement is the Lord's and it is holy unto the Lord. Now, Cain was disobedient by not bringing the fruit of the tree. Now, stay with me here. Don't, don't miss this. If Cain did not bring the fruit of the tree, he did not bring the seed. If I cut an apple in half, what is in the center of it? The seed. The seed that I can plant and grow another tree. Now watch. All the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, they needed the fruit. Now, when, when that took place, he did not bring the fruit. He did not bring the seed. It said he only brought the vegetables. So when we look at this, how much more important is the seed than the harvest? The harvest is what's important to us, but not to God. Not to God. What matters is the seed. Because that seed determines whether next year you're going to have a harvest. If I have no seed to plant next year, if my crop's bad this year, and I don't get no seed for next year, where am I at? I have nothing. Now, what this tells me is this. If I'm bringing my best, if I'm bringing my best, that means my harvest next year is going to be dependent upon God. And that is where Cain failed. He was not putting his dependency on God for the next season. And this is where we fall so many times. We are so wrapped up in our own lives that we forget how to get out of this season to get to the next. We all live in seasons. Sometimes it's, it's a winter, summer, fall. But there's only one time of the year for harvest. And that's where we gain the seed to get through the next year. So when we look at it in that way, it takes dependence beyond God. And this is where Cain failed. It is again confirmed in uh, number 1035. And to bring the first fruits of our, of our ground and the first fruits of all fruit of the tree year by year into the house of the Lord. Cain was required to bring all of the seed, all of the first fruits. And that's the seed. And that's what we must understand. Many were going to shout, hey, this is under the law. They weren't under the law. Well, that's true. But I believe this. How did they even know to make that sacrifice? How did Abel know how to make that sacrifice? We don't have no record of it. They weren't under the law. That's true. But how did they know to make that sacrifice? God had to tell them in some way, some form, how to make that sacrifice. He gave them orders in that somehow. I don't know. We don't have record of it. But in order for them to do it, they had to understand how to do it. And I believe these verses proved what Cain was supposed to do. And he did not do it. He refused to bring the seed because he wanted the good fruit all to himself. He stuck that for himself. And this is where we fail so many times. They still understood, and so do we. Cain held back his best is the point. He held back his best. And this is where he got into trouble. He simply gave God his leftovers. He gave God the leftovers. Thomas Kempis wrote this, and this is really good. Instant obedience is the only kind of obedience there is. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Whoever strives to withdraw from obedience withdraws from grace. That's a powerful statement, but we must look at this in the right light disobedience can attack in any form it attacks us all the time it's easy to let our mind work and think that i can get through a situation that i'm just can can rationalize this thing away we just can't rationalize something away we got to stand strong in the word of god because if we rationalize it away it's going to cause our eyes to come off that narrow path and when it comes off the narrow path we have nowhere to turn don't be as cain and live in disobedience Give God the best. Don't give him the crumbs from the table. Don't give him your leftovers. Stand strong in the scripture. Stand strong in obedience. Let us as the old hymn say, I surrender all.
I surrender all. Because that's how we should be living. We should be able to surrender all without a reservation. But that requires to do one thing. It requires to search our life. It requires us to search our heart. Am I walking in obedience? Strict obedience. Not rationalizing how it fits into my life or my plan. The narrow path is what we must focus on. I constantly go back to this because it, it, it honestly, as a pastor, scares me. Few that find it. How many people will be sitting in a church service this morning knowing they live in disobedience? Knowing that they live in disobedience. Thinking they're on that narrow path. And then in the end, they hear them words, depart from me, for I know you not. At that moment, we're going to look back over our life and say, why did I not obey? Now, we can look at that and say, ah, that's this preacher mumbo jumbo. Well, go for that then. But the end's going to prove everything in our life. The end will prove it all. We only have one shot at life. We only have one shot at eternity. And if I'm walking in obedience and I'm serving Christ, not out of here, but out of here, the difference will be made. Because then I won't be walking in my own sinful lust and flesh. I will be walking in the obedience, dying daily. Why? Because I'm purchased with a price. I am owned by Christ whether we want to believe it or not, whether we want to live it or not, we must come to that place. Father, we thank you for the love of Jesus. Father, there is no greater blessing than walking in your presence.